Can everyone hear me? Good. I'm going to talk today about the unsung heroines of Yolo County. Most of them do not appear in our local histories. Some of them are unknown outside the county. Their kind of heroism is not particularly dramatic. It's of the type described in a saying of the mountain men of the Caucasus. Heroism is endurance for one moment more. And that's the definition we're going to be using tonight, and you'll see how it applies as we go along. Though unsung, these heroines have made a difference here, as I learned as I started delving into Yolo County's history. And I came to appreciate the truth of what I heard Merlene Williams say once. She's a lecturer in American Studies at UC Davis. And she said, and this is a quote, women have shaped history through community building. Women perceive a community need, meet informally, raise funds, and build an orphanage or establish a campfire girl group. And when it's big enough to be institutionalized, men become the board of directors and it enters history. At that point, women become volunteers or members of the auxiliary. Perhaps you appreciate the truth of that. In my books, I've tried to present as true a picture of our county's history as I could within the tr limitations of availability of information and my time and skill in finding and using that information. There are probably more men than women in my books but this evening, I want to concentrate on the ladies. God bless them. First off, to just put this into perspective, a little bit of background about our county. Yolo County was established on February 18, 1850, as one of the original 27 counties created by California's first legislature. The name Yolo comes from the Patwin Indian word, which means a place abounding in tules or rushes. There were women in this area before 1850. Two to 4,000 years ago, Native Americans, Miwok, Patwin, Nishinen, settled along the Sacramento River and along Puta and Cache Creeks. And in the, uh, in the interior, and as our slide is on, right? This first heroine is a Patwin woman, Isadora Solano, who was born in Yolo County in 1784, and she lived to be over 90. This is a photo of a sandstone sculpture of her and her husband, the Sassoon chief Francisco Solano. Isadora Sol Solano was brought up as a Christian by Spanish missionaries, and she was taught to be charitable toward the poor and compassionate to prisoners. Once her husband led a band of 8,000 Sassoon into battle, and they captured a large number of prisoners. Isadora told an interviewer many years later, she said, I prevented him from killing them with arrows. I said to him, turn them loose with Vallejo, who will make them work the land. Solano agreed, and the lives of the prisoners were saved. No foreigners entered into the land of the Patwin until early in the 19th century. The first ones to come were Spanish explorers who came up the Sacramento River looking for runaway Indians and sites for settlement. Then came American hunters and trappers looking for furs and adventure. In the 1840s, the first families arrived to settle here on land granted to them by the Mexican government. Then gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill on the American River, January 24, 1848. By that summer, the word was out to the east and abroad, and soon the gold rush was on. There weren't very many people in our area at that time. 
An early account stated, quote, the inhabitants of Yolo from 25 to 30 in all, all went in search of gold. And these rich agricultural re regions were depopulated. These inhabitants who were really farmers, most of them, soon found that their real gold was in the soil and the water of the valley and they returned to become the founding fathers of Yolo County. And I use the word fathers advisedly because most of them were men. The census of 1852 recorded a total county population of 1,440 people. Of those, 232 were women, 189 white, and 43 Indian. What was Yolo County like in 1850? Mostly flat, wide open spaces, barren hills, great expanses of tules covering most of the eastern half of the county, floods in the winter, hot, dry summers, mosquitoes everywhere, a constant annoyance and a health danger, wild animals roaming the plains, deer, elk, antelope, grizzly bears, very few people, a few houses widely scattered, the only means of transportation, boats on the water, or along a few trails on horseback or, by, um, or on foot. The first communities in the county were along the river, the Sacramento River, where enterprising souls began to cater to the needs of the adventurers who were coming up the river from San Francisco on their way to the gold fields. One of these towns was Washington, and it was founded by a woman Margaret McDowell. Washington was later known as Broderick and is now part of the city of West Sacramento. Margaret McDowell is one of my favorite heroines. She was born in 1823 in Pennsylvania and at the age of 17 she married James McDowell and followed him across the country to California, bearing him three children en route and they came overland by covered wagon. Their little family arrived at Sutter's Fort in 1845, and James soon took off to fight in the Mexican War, leaving his wife and children behind at the fort. After his safe return, James bought some land on the west bank of the Sacramento River, opposite what is now Old Town, and he built a log cabin, and in 1847 settled down there quietly with his family, which by now included five children. Then came the gold rush, and Sutter's little outpost became the city of Sacramento, a noisy boom town with plenty of saloons and no churches. James, who was never one to resist temptation, was killed in a barroom brawl in May of 1849, and Margaret was left a widow at the age of 26. She had five small children, a house, and a garden. She could not read or write. Historian Frank Gilbert in the Illustrated Atlas of 1879 said this of Margaret. She found a cow belonging to Mr. Childs, who later came to Davis, in her garden, eating up the vegetables that were a source of revenue to her, and recognizing it as one that had given her considerable trouble before she took down her husband's old rifle, shot the animal, and then paid a Negro an ounce of gold dust to throw the carcass in the river. That was Margaret. But what could a widow do to provide for herself and her children on the banks of the Sacramento? Margaret did have a house, which was rare at that time when most of the people lived in tents. So she took in boarders. Then, in August of 1849, she had 160 acres of land surveyed and drew up a town plat, which you see here. And she began selling city lots. She sold her first one in November for $500. The next year, she married Dr. Enos Taylor and became the respected Mrs. Taylor. She had another child and established a school, the first school there, for her children. 
She and her husband bought and sold property, and they built the two-story town hall, which they rented to the county of Yolo to serve as the courthouse, for Washington had been designated the county seat in 1850. Several years later, the good Dr. Taylor apparently took to drink and gambling, and Margaret McDowell divorced him in 1871. She sued to regain the right to sell the property she had owned before their marriage, and the court finally awarded her half the unsold property. She outlived Dr. Taylor and died in 1883 at the age of 59, the leading citizen of the town she had founded. Meanwhile, back in the county, during the 50 years between the, its founding in 1850 and 1900, Yolo County grew and prospered. Its farms became famous for purebred livestock, wheat and barley, and all kinds of fruits and nuts. Towns developed along the river and early roads, and later along the railroads that crossed through the county. Davisville, Woodland, Cashville, now Yolo, Knight's Landing, Zamora, Dunnigan, Winters, Madison, Esparto, and the little villages in the Cape Valley. The county's population increased 10 times to 13,618 by 1900. What kinds of things were women doing in the latter half of the 19th century? Well, obviously, most of them were at home, and they were their husbands' partners. Yolo County had been an has been an agricultural area since its beginning, and most of the farmers lived on their own land. And each farm had to be pretty self-sufficient, mainly because it was hard to get from one place to another, and there wasn't much to buy in the stores anyway. The farmer's wife worked hard without modern conveniences. Our next heroine was a farmer's wife, Jane Zimmerman Morris. She was the first wife of Asa Morris, a pioneer who moved to Yolo County in 1850. Asa returned to Pennsylvania and persuaded Jane, pictured here, who was 15, to elope with him and come to his ranch near Knight's Landing. Imagine the courage of that young woman. They came by boat via Panama in 1858. Jane's diaries from 1865 and 1866 survive, and we have a good idea through them of what pioneer life was like. My definition of heroism as enduring one moment more really does show here for instance, here is Jane's entry for February 4th, 1865, quote, Asa and all four men plowing and sowing and harrowing lot below orchard for cow pasture, clear and north wind strong. I cook and bake and dress over bake butter and bake and scrub and cut out two more shirts. That was that day. Her only child died at 15 months, and Jane herself only lived 31 years, dying in 1869, probably of tuberculosis. In addition to housekeeping, a farmer's wife had plenty of chores, and there was cooking for the harvesters. You know, this was grain country, and there were these big fields with barley and wheat, and big threshing machines were expensive, so when it came time to harvest the grain, the big machines and teams of workers would go from ranch to ranch. And the women would gather from the various ranches and cook three hearty meals a day for the big work crews. And they had the same kinds of activities at fruit picking time. Most of these women had their kitchen gardens where they raised vegetables and fruits, then they canned them and preserved them for the long winter. They made all their clothes, they often spun and wove the cloth, or perhaps they were able to buy it in a store, and then they had to sew it up. In town, things weren't much easier. In Woodland, for instance, there was no gas until 1900, no electricity until about 1901, and only a few telephones before 1900. This meant no refrigeration, 
daily marketing and cooking, or daily harvesting from the garden, no electric lights, which meant kerosene lamps that somebody had to clean the glass chimneys every morning afterwards, and no washing machines. One of my favorite other heroines is a woman I've gotten to know quite well, Leela Hecky Hardy. Some of you may know her. She was brought up on a ranch, Yolanda, which is about halfway between Davis and Woodland, in the early years of the 20th century. And this is a quote from her. She said, we didn't have any washing machines in those days. Mother had a big galvanized round tub that she had out back. They had to heat the water on the stove in the kitchen and carry the kettles from the kitchen out there and pour it into the tubs. They washed everything by washboard. Then the laundry had to be rinsed and rinsed and rinsed and hung out on the line. It was an awful job. And of course, mother always made all the soap from the fat that was left over from beef and from pork. The women also, of course, were the principal people to bear, they were the only ones to bear the children and the principal ones to raise the children. Large families were common because children were needed to do the chores. And of course, there was a very high mortality rate because the childhood diseases, there was no vaccine uh, and childcare was very hard to come by. And then these women, if they were widowed, they had their own life to do. What would they do then? They might take over the management of their husband's ranch or business. One woman, Sid Mrs. Sidney Leathers, the Leathers are an old family around here, she was born in 1879 and she bore six children. And after her husband died, she took active management of their 250 acres, producing splendid crops of alfalfa, grain, and livestock. In her obituary, they said, she has made a splendid contribution to the PTA and every worthwhile community interest. In religion, she is a Protestant. In politics, a Democrat. Her home is a house of contentment, peace, and pleasant memories. Other widows might take in boarders, like Mary, Margaret McDowell. And this was particularly common in Woodland, where they had very large houses, the ones along College Street and First that were built in the 1870s and 80s. And if a woman were single, what would she do? Many of them were teachers. I found a quote in a book by Julie Jeffrey on frontier women that said, the teacher was a kind of mother. Teaching represented the road to honorable independence and extensive usefulness, because a woman would never find it necessary to outstep the prescribed boundaries of feminine modesty. Often, women with some education taught school before they were married. The first woman teacher in Yolo County we know about was Matilda McCord, who came out from Bloomington, Illinois, during the summer of 1849. And she opened up a school that fall in Fremont, which was a little community on the river. We don't have a picture of Matilda, but this picture of Hazel Hyde Mayhew and her class was typical of 19th century school pictures. In those days, a teacher might be paid $100 a month for five months a year for teaching 20 children between the ages of five and 18 in a one-room schoolhouse. If you ever go to the schoolhouse on, during Yolo County Fair time at the fairgrounds, you can see what we're talking about. To qualify for the job, the school trustees would ask her a few questions give her some words to spell and ask her to read something like two poems by Longfellow. Then she was uh, equipped to teach the 20 kids. Perhaps the most famous woman educator in Yolo County was Harriet Stoddard Lee. She was born in Sutter County in 1859, one of 10 children. She was well educated by anyone's standards, having graduated from Hesperian College, which was a church-run school in Woodland for boys and girls up to college age. The school offered everything from English and penmanship 
to bookkeeping and telegraphy to ancient history and Greek. Harriet then went to college, which was unusual for women in the 1870s. She went to Teachers Preparatory School in Sacramento, which is the forerunner of the present Sac State. She taught school in Woodland for 35 years and then was elected county superintendent of schools. She served in that position 13 years and retired in 1927. In 1951, after her death at the age of 92, the Woodland School Board named a school after her, Lee Junior High, which is still standing. And although Miss Lee was widely respected and loved as a teacher, she's probably best remembered as the originator of Mother's Day in California. And when they asked her how she got the idea for Mother's Day, she said that she was talking about women's suffrage with a class of boys and girls in her class in Woodland. And one boy said emphatically that he was against the idea. And she asked him why. Didn't he think his mother would have as, should have as much voice in government as bums on the street? To which the brave little fellow replied, no, she hasn't sense enough. That apparently piqued Miss Lee's interest because she decided that she would see if she could educate this boy. So she got the idea of having the students decorate a chair to serve as a throne for the mother who would be chosen queen of the day. And when the mother was chosen by vote of the students, it remained only for Miss Lee to select her escort. And she picked the boy who felt his mother didn't have enough sense to vote. He was so proud, Miss Lee said, that it gave me the idea about setting a day aside to revere mothers. And in 1903, she persuaded the native daughters of the Golden West, of which she was a member, to set aside one day a year to honor American mothers. By 1909, the support for Mother's Day was great enough for the state of California to adopt the idea officially. And in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day in the United States. Not all women in the 1870s and 80s were teachers. Those were the days when orchards were becoming an important part of the county's agricultural economy, with apricots, prunes, and grapes as cash crops. Farmers with small farms, say 160 acres or less, could make good money. The work was seasonal from late June to November, and large numbers of laborers were needed to pick them and cut and process the fruit. Their pay was low, but women flocked to the jobs to earn the money to support their families or for extra spending money. This slide shows the apricot cutting shed at Yolanda, which was the ranch of the Heckey uh, ranch that's about halfway between Davis and Woodland. The boxes that you see here weighed from 30 to 50 pounds. Women got paid by the box for cutting the apricots and removing the pits. In the 1880s, they got 10 cents a box. Later, this went up to 35 cents. A good cutter could do 10 boxes a day, six days a week during the season. This shows the Earl Fruit Company in Winters. Uh, essentially the same thing. You'll notice that most of the workers are women. Many of these were um, respectable housewives from Winters or Woodland or Davis who really wanted the extra money. Leela Hardy told me that in, at Yolanda they had dormitories upstairs and the women would come of a Sunday evening and spend from Sunday through Thursday in the dormitory upstairs, cut fruit all day, and then they would go home to their families on the weekends. This is Leela Hardy as a young woman on a tractor. Some women did active farm work like Leela, and she was born on that ranch, and she started at a very young age. This is a Holt Brothers harvester. During World War I, when Leela was 17, she took over management of her father's apricot shed and she ran it by herself until they got rid of the apricots after World War II. 
This, when I was doing Leela's oral history some years ago, I ran across this quote in a newspaper. It was from the San Francisco Chronicle, July 8, 1918. And the big headline says, Girl directs Big Fruit Ranch. And this was the quote that the, she told the uh, reporter. She said, I can see no reason why a woman cannot think, act, and execute the everyday things of life precisely the same as a boy. We all like the trifling and easier things usually given over to women, but in a time like this, she was referring to World War I, I believe every woman possesses the grit and the executive ability, ability if they will simply permit themselves to rise above the insignificant place custom has fixed for them. Leela, if you know her, you know that she's about four feet ten. She is still living. She's certainly not, does not occupy an insignificant place. Besides teaching and farm work, some women became nurses. Nursing was a profession that had gained considerable respect as a result of Florence Nightingale's efforts in the Crimean War in 1854. In the United States, nurses were praised for their service in the Civil War. And I'm going to now talk about a few of the nurses who made lasting contributions to improved health care in Yolo County. This is one of my favorites. This is Mary Frances Nicholson Gaither. She was born in Missouri in 1865. And she was orphaned when she was 10 years old and was taken into the home of a doctor to care for his young son. And the doctor trained her as a nurse and a midwife. And she came to California as a young woman and married Gus Gaither, who owned a grove of walnut trees near Esparto, and he sold the wood to make furniture. She established a nursing home in her house in Esparto, and she took in boarders and nursed the sick. She also traveled all around the area to treat the sick, first in a horse and buggy and later in a Ford Model T. She delivered two generations of babies in the Cape Valley, black and white, either in her home or in the home she visited. And she died in 1939, one of the best known and most respected people in the area. This um, is a picture of the old Woodland Sanitarium. Kathleen McConnell was another nurse. She founded the institution that evolved into Woodland Memorial Hospital. In June 1905, there was no private hospital in the county. Doctors usually went to patients' homes. Any surgery was done at home, usually on the kitchen table, using the implements at hand. The nurses went ahead of the doctors and re were responsible for preparing the place for surgery. They took down all the curtains. They scrubbed the walls with carbolic acid. They boiled the instruments. Instruments often would be your carving knife and whatever. And they made sure that there were plenty of clean sheets and cloths on hand. Well, Kathleen had been trained as a nurse in San Francisco, as had her two sisters. Together, they rented a seven-room house on College Street and turned it into a small, small hospital, which they called the Woodland Sanitarium. This is a picture of that house, and the house is still standing. In the house, they provided a clean environment. They already had done all the scrubbing. They had clean, sterile medical instruments and experienced nurses. Within a short time, all the physicians and surgeons in the county were bringing their patients there. For four years, Kate McConnell was the superintendent of the sanitarium. Then she married Frank Mixon, who was the editor of the Woodland Mail. A group of doctors bought the sanitarium from her in 1911, and they soon moved a few blocks away to the corner of Third and Cross and built a 17-bed hospital. Over the years, the facility was enlarged and the name changed to the Woodland Clinic. A new building was constructed at its present location out on Gibson and Cottonwood in 1967, and the former hospital is now a skilled nursing center. This building is a private home. 
Another nurse from Woodland was Ella Childers Doster. She commanded an ambulance corps in World War I. She served as a Red Cross nurse in France before the United States entered the war, and she received a medal for bravery at Verdun in 1916. In 1917, when the United States entered the war, she received a commission in the United States Army, and she served in France until the armistice. There were no women doctors in the county I've been able to locate in the 19th century, but women have practiced medicine here in growing numbers in the 20th century. Many of you in Davis were acquainted with Ruth Charlotte Risden Storer, who was born in 1888, and she only died in 1986. She was a Davis physician. She graduated in 1910 from the University of California Medical School in San Francisco and was the school's first intern in pediatrics. She established the West Berkeley Children's Clinic in 1917. In 1912, she moved with her husband, Tracy Storr, who was a faculty member at Davis, and established a practice in Davis in the care of young children. In later years, she helped to set up well baby clinics in Clarksburg, Broderick, Bright, West Sacramento, Yolo, and Knight's Landing. And she continued to work in the Clarksburg and Bright clinics herself until her 80th birthday. Before she died in 1986, a garden in her name was established on the Davis campus at the west end of the Arboretum. You're probably all quite familiar with that lovely garden. Life for women started changing in the last years of the 19th century. Pioneering days were over. Farmers were getting richer by growing and selling grain or fruit or livestock. Roads, railroads, steamships made transportation easier and communication faster. Women who formerly had spent their entire days coping with husband, children, and housekeeping now had help, if you will recall, help. A Chinese cook, perhaps, and a, quote, girl to help with the laundry. And the matrons had some free time to look around the world outside themselves. They did what women have always done. They got together, and they talked, and they exchanged ideas, and they decided to work together to do some good for themselves, for their families, their towns, and for women in general. The first kinds of groups were ch church groups. Nice ladies like Mary Alice Morris, whose picture is here. She was the second wife of Asa Morris. Nice ladies like Mrs. Morris didn't meet in public places without their husbands, so they met in homes. In the earliest days in the county, there weren't any churches, and ministers preached outdoors or in homes. And in Yolo County, it was often the women who built the churches. Many of the families that first settled here were from the Middle West and East, where there were towns with substantial buildings, big homes that could accommodate big families in cold winters, solid brick schoolhouses, impressive courthouses with tall pillars, and fine churches with steeples. Not surprisingly, the women wanted buildings like that here. This is Mary's Chapel. It's an isolated country church located at the intersection of County Road 15 and 99, just east of the town of Yolo, north of Woodland. It was built in 1900, replacing an earlier church building which stood in the center of the cemetery that goes way back to 1857. The chapel was named for Mary Cross Pockman, who, was, who had crossed the plains in 1852 and the building was built through the efforts of women. Mary Morris, whose picture we just saw, Mary Pockman, and other members of the Cashville community. A more recent example of women's efforts to build a church is this Church of the Holy Myrrh-Bearing Women in Bright. Russians who had fled Russia after the revolution in 1918 
Some of them came and settled on the west bank of the Sacramento River, just upstream from Margaret McDowell's Washington. The Russian women, many of whom didn't speak English then and still don't, missed their homeland and their customs, and particularly their church. Their husbands were working, many of them, in the Southern Pacific Railroad yards in Sacramento. So the women got together to build a church where they could worship their God in their own language. It took three years, but they did it. They got some money from the Serbian church in Jackson, and the rest by giving dinners, bake sales, and by going door to door in Sacramento asking for money. The church, this church building, was designed by Nicholas Koschel, the 16-year-old son of one of these Russian women. The men did the heavy work at night and on weekends, and the women did much of the painting and furnishing. The first wheelbarrow of dirt was borne away by an 80-year-old woman. In March 1927, the church was consecrated by the Russian Orthodox bishop. The church is used today. Interestingly enough, only men are permitted in the sanctuary of the church, except on cleaning days when the women wash the altar. If you want to see the church, it looks much more elegant than this now. It has greenery around it and a gold dome. It's in um, bright, um, within sight of Emma's Taco House. This is Sarah, or Aunt Sally, Houston. In the 1870s and 80s, many of the women who were active in their churches, particularly in the Protestant churches with strict ethical teachings, were attracted to the women's Christian temperance movement. The National WCTU was founded in Cleveland in 1874, and by the 1880s was the largest women's volunteer organization in the United States. Its main purpose was to protect the home and to develop Christian citizenship through individual commitments to total abstinence from all use of alcoholic beverages and through the abolition of the liquor traffic. Their motto was, quote, for God and home and every land, quote, and their insignia was a bow of white ribbon. To join the organization, they signed the pledge, paid their $1 a year dues. The Woodland WCTU was organized in 1883 and the Davis Union in 1888, and they held weekly prayer meetings with songs, recitations, and refreshments, and they accomplished a remarkable variety of things. To combat drunkenness, they sponsored essays in the, in the schools. They distributed leaflets at places like the railroad depots, and they circulated petitions in favor of closing saloons on Sundays, and they published the names of the saloon petitioners. Aunt Sally Houston, pictured here, was one of the leaders of the WCTU and was one of the most remarkable women in Yolo County's history. She was born Sarah Loganauer in 1848 in North Carolina, and she came with her family to Yolo County by way of the Panama Canal in 1865, 66, after fleeing the wreckage of the South after the Civil War. Like many other pioneer women, she taught school for a couple of years in a one-room schoolhouse, and she married Walter Houston in 1869 and moved to Woodland where she raised six children and joined the Christian church and became a respected and well-known member of Woodland Society. She and some of her friends helped to organize the Woodland WCTU, and they began to get interested in social issues. In 1891, her husband had a paralytic stroke, and he died three years later. So here she was at 43 with her six children to raise and educate, and what was she going to do? Well, she became a newspaper woman. With the financial backing of her sister-in-law, Emma Lagenauer, who was a very wealthy woman, she established a newspaper, the Home Alliance, which was devoted to prohibition of the liquor traffic and equal rights for women. She was the editor and publisher of the paper for 35 years until her death in 1926. 
She was also president of both Woodland and Yolo County WCTU, and she helped develop the Woodland Cemetery and served on its board for 30 years. She was appointed to the Woodland uh, City Board of Trustees, their city council, in 1917 to replace a male trustee who had gone to war. In the early years of the 20th century, the WCTU and the California Federation of Women's Clubs joined forces to promote women's suffrage. This slide shows the current Topics Club of Woodland, which was one of the most active women's clubs in the county. Together, they circulated petitions, held rallies, and lobbied extensively for vote for women. One of the most vocal club women in Woodland was the rancher, Emily Hoppen. She made speeches all over California urging that women be given the right to vote. Listen to what she said. For over 75 years, there has been a stir and a protest among women. They have tried to lift themselves from their man-given sphere. It has been opposed and misunderstood always by old ideas, by ignorance and prejudice. Those of us who are protected and secure in our homes do not realize that all women are not so protected, but have wrongs that need redressing. Women are large taxpayers in our states. In some counties, my own for instance, a large percentage of the taxes come from women, yet we have no word to say in regard to the roads, the schools, the government, the environments of our homes, or the conditions of society around our children." End quote. Imagine Emily's joy and that of her friend Sarah Houston when California adopted a constitutional amendment in 1911 giving women the right to vote, nine years before the U.S. adopted the 19th Amendment. The women went right out and registered, and within a month, their votes had helped to close down all the saloons in Yolo County, except in District 1 of Broderick. Women did not commonly hold political office in Yolo County in the early years of the 20th century, even after they got the right to vote. One exception was Lydia Lawhead, who was pictured here, who was the first woman elected to the Woodland City Council. She ran in 1915 and was elected for four years. At the time I was researching Lydia's story, I went through a whole lot of the newspapers of that time, and I was fascinated to note that although she was reported very often in the newspapers, in, in the coverage of the election, not one article mentioned the fact that she was a woman. She was just Mrs. Lawhead. Besides battling devil rum and getting the vote, women volunteers were working together in public to improve their communities. In the early years of the 20th century, there was a great feeling of optimism, a feeling that people could do things to make the world a better place to live in. Encouraged by the local chambers of commerce, which were organizations of business people, principally men, women formed improvement clubs. This shot slide shows a fundraising luncheon held by the Davis Improvement Club. The Davis Improvement Club was organized in 1905 and its first president was Jenny Drummond Lillard Reed. She was widowed at the age of 25 and left with a two-year-old son, but Jenny was another heroine who endured. She married again and she became one of Davis's most respected and beloved civic activists. Interested in reading, she was a member of the Bachelor Girls Club that raised funds for the Davis Free Library that was built at 117 F Street in 1911. That building was enlarged and remodeled in 1924 and served as the Davis branch of the Yolo County Library until 1969 when a new building was built up on 14th Street. The 1924 library, as you probably are aware, 
was moved to Central Park on March 28, 1992 and opened as the Hattie Weber Museum of Davis. The Davis Women's Improvement Club worked hard to raise money for things like libraries through card parties, bake sales, theatrical productions, and luncheons. And among their achievements were fire escapes for the schoolhouse, preservation of trees along city streets, and the Davis Arch. You can see a mural of this arch on a building in um, Davis to this day. The arch was built in 1916, and it was at the corner of 2nd and G, opposite the railway station, and it, facing sort of towards campus. Pedestrians and vehicles passed under the arch on their way to the brand new university farm, which had been established 10 years earlier in 1906. Unfortunately, soon after the arch was built, it became a traffic hazard, and it was torn down in the early 20s. But it was, a, it was a symbol of welcome and aren't we a great town and aren't we working hard to improve it. Other women's improvement clubs were organized all over the county. There was one in Woodland, Winters, Rumsey, Knights Landing, Broderick, Bright, Esparto, and West Sacramento. But by the time of World War I, the women's improvement clubs as such were no longer active except in the Cape Valley, where the Home Improvement Club in Rumsey is still in existence. World War I opened women's eyes to the world beyond their own communities, and their volunteer activities reflected their broader interests. The organizations that women joined then are familiar to us today. Red Cross, first for war efforts, then for help in crises like the flu epidemic in 1918, or major floods or accidents. And then there were social and literary clubs like the Women's Shakespeare Club, Town and Country Club in Woodland, and University Farm Circle. There was even a League of Women Voters in Woodland in 1923, 30 years before the Davis Group was organized. Women also found their way into the workplace. Some were temporary replacements for men who were away at war, who became permanent employees. Others were single women faced with the necessity of supporting themselves. Still others were married women who worked in family-owned businesses or in whatever jobs they could find. These next few pictures are of women working in different types of jobs. This was the Davisville Post Office in 1912. This was the telephone office in Davis in 1916, proudly showing off her brand new equipment up there. This is in the Buena Vista Hotel in Davis, and this is Jakey Grieve, and that was a family-owned business, and she helped run that. And this was the Nickerson Ice Company in 1928. Women had, were no longer even had to work for family. They could be hired out, and it was still, it was respectable. My last heroine is Evelyn Holland, pictured here. She was born in San Francisco in 1900, and she had a rather ordinary education, and she completed business school. And she had went to work for the large agribusiness firm River Farms of California as a stenographer in their San Francisco office in 1921. Though the company was large, with enormous farm acreage in Yolo County, north of Knight's Landing, the office was small. And Miss Holland, as she was always called, her entire life she was called Miss Holland by everyone gradually assumed more and more responsibilities. She was made assistant secretary treasurer of the company in 1931 and general manager in 1940. As manager, she was responsible for all operations of the company, accountable to a distant board of directors and hundreds of stockholders. 
She moved to Woodland in 1949 to assume hands-on control of the farm. An article in the Rice Journal in 1956 began with these words, quote, not many women have the courage and ability to manage a 14,000 acre farm. However, in California's Sacramento Valley, there is such a woman, Evelyn Holland, end quote. I learned just how much courage it took for a woman to do a man's job in a man's world when I interviewed Ms. Holland's secretary recently. She had worked for her. She said, at first, the men wouldn't have anything to do with Ms. Holland. But she was so smart and so competent and so hardworking and so firm while always appearing so feminine that she soon earned their respect and their undying loyalty. Miss Holland lived in Woodland 20 years until her death in 1969, and there too she won affection and respect for her energy and her civic awareness. She was an active member and a president of the Seroptimist Club. She organized the second Horizons Club, and she served as chairman of the Woodland Planning Commission. In closing, I want to stress that we have a great deal to learn from history. As George Santayana said, quote, those who do not know the past are condemned to relive it. Women's struggle for acceptance as equals in a society where winning is everything has been a difficult one and it isn't over yet. Men and women today need to know about heroines like the ones here in Yolo County. We've come a long way. Let's not forget it. Thank you.